Thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Let me share my presentation. Oh. Okay, here it is. Share. Okay. Okay. Now is is it okay? Is it now viewable? Yes, sir. We can see your presentation now. Okay. That's great. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, particularly Dr. Ruena Varela of Caragay State University, Dr. Uh, Manuel Mohe, the president of Polytechnic University of the Philippines, and Dr. Jinky Bornales, the, the vice chancellor for research and development and innovation at uh, Mindanao State University in Iligan City. So uh, thank you. And also, I also appreciate the the presentation of the three uh, previous presenters because their their topics are also related especially on materials engineering presented by Dr. Diesel and and also in the case of Dr. Bailon, he also introduced about retrofitting of existing structures using FRGC or polymer. So uh, I will be presenting to you now the actually these are just the updates and the initiatives that I've conducted in the past five years. It is about on the fiber reinforced geopolymer composites, or I would always say this as FRGC, on how on how our structures can can be on how this uh, how this material can be an access or an avenue to make our infrastructures more sustainable. And uh, first is I would like to give a background on the FRGC, how what is the composition and also the properties and how it behaves when you're going to apply either in practical application and also when you are doing some tests in laboratory scale. Then after that, I will show you some of the, of the practical application of FRGC in the field of civil engineering and infrastructures so that you can also relate on, on how, how this material, on how this material behave when it is being used in practical application. Then after that, I will be uh, also showing you the research studies that I have conducted, and also the, re the research studies they ha that others are conduct have already conducted, that are that where I am also involved. So uh, to give you uh, updates on the things that I have done, uh, whether whether here in Denmark and also also in the Philippines and and some 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 parts of of the world, and also. We will be also discussing on the studies in which we can also work together, collaborations, and also other initiatives for partnership. Because I believe that uh, you know uh, most of you have a very good idea, but what we need now is to make that uh, happen by simply establishing a proposal, and of course linking with other people. For example, yesterday I have I have attended a conference on the ASEP, and then uh, we have the the speakers coming from EPFL and is working also on calcine clay and she might be also a potential collaborators if we'll be making some proposal either funded by the by the Philippine government the DOST or overseas now uh, what is an FRGC so FRGC are type of or type or com uh, type of engineered com cementitious composite so by the term engineered cementitious composites you can see that uh, this is basically 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 composed of uh, a mortar you know a cement base or sometimes they are using concrete so mortar on concrete and then they put some short fibers and uh, collectively they are called as ECC or what we call engineered cementitious composites just like what you see now sometimes for short fibers they use synthetic for example, carbon fiber, they also use that one, or polyvinyl alcohol fibers, that is synthetic. And sometimes also they used uh, natural fibers, abaca, hemp, or even pineapple uh, fibers. They also they can also use that one here. And uh, in the case of FRGC, now instead of using cement base, we use 
geopolymer. And geopolymer, uh, you can also you can also find some terms what that are being used by researchers. They also call this as alkali activated binder because uh, before this can be uh, this needs some activator, and we we want we we are we are in need of an alkali uh, alkali solutions in order to make this active. And uh, when when it is only composed of when it is only composed of a let us say a uh, geopolymer precursor and also by the alkali acti activator, it is called as geopolymer. However, when we add additional aggregates such as such as sand, it becomes now geopolymer mortar. So that is that is just uh, just for just first for added input for us. And for FRGC, there are two main components. We have the geopolymer mortar, and also we have the short fibers, and then we combine them together. Now, as what I have said, we, we sometimes use a synthetic fiber or also natural fibers. Now, first is I will discuss uh, the, the formation or the, 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 the uh, geopolymerization, ge geopolymerization process and also how to make a geopolymer mortar. So, according to Davidovitz, now geopolymer is an inorganic aluminosilicate compound, and usually this can be these are uh, coming from a waste materials, but they are rich in silicon and aluminium, and those are the the, the important uh, characteristics. Huh? This is most of the most of the uh, component or the major component is is actually silicon and aluminium, and then uh, 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 these precursors are actually coming from, for example, we have the fly ash. We also have the, we also have from this figure, let me use some pointer here. Okay, laser point. So, uh, geopolymer precursors can be a, a fly ash, this one, and also a ground granulated uh, blast furnace slag, and also the metacholine powder. Later on, I also I will also give you some uh, some of the potential uh, geopolymer precursor in which uh, 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 these are uh, rich or or or, is, or available in in Mindanao area, which we can also explore. And if we combine this one together and then we put an activator, this becomes now a geopolymer paste or binder. And if we put an aggregate, which is uh, let us say a, a a fine aggregate sand it becomes a mortar now if we put another aggregate which is now a coarse aggregate or gravel it becomes now a geopolymer concrete so that is actually that is actually how uh, how geopolymer paste geopolymer mortar and geopolymer concrete can be can be defined okay so uh, these are the the, the common, no? these are the common uh, precursor material for geopolymer. We have first is the fly ash, and fly ash are waste material coming from coal power plant. No? There are bottom ash and there are also fly ash. And fly ash uh, can, be, can be categorized whether it is class C or class F, depending on the content. But usually we use class F fly ash. And then another uh, precursor is the calcine clay. No? This is actually a calcine clay coming from metacholine. This is a calcine clay. And then uh, also uh, the one that we have now is uh, the coming from the steel industry. That is the ground granulated blast furnace slag. So these are the three common precursors in making geopolymer. Now, there are also studies conducted that even Iraq quarries and also mine tailings can also be used as precursor of geopolymer mortar or geopolymer concrete and also they also some includes also volcanic ash no? so we can also use that one provided that uh, uh, they can be activated using alkaline and then we can also call them as alkaline activated materials so let us compare. Uh, there are some two comparison between fly ash, metacholine powder, and also GGBS. No? So uh, the metacholine here is actually uh, demonstrating less impurities. No? As a result, they are providing a good mechanical properties. This one is uh, metacholine powder or calcium clay provided a good mechanical properties over FA or GGBS. And the other one, 
on the other hand, uh, fly ash and also GGBS are cheaper compared to MK because fly ash and GGBS can be found, you know, in sometimes in landfill, sometimes also sometimes also waste uh, waste coming from the industry. However, MK need to be reprocessed. No, this need to be calcined. This means to say, just like cement, this needs to be this needs to to do to be preprocessed, and that also provide additional expenses. So that's why, by comparison, if A and GGBS is are less are cheaper compared to that of the MK powder. I summarized. This is around uh, I think around 100, 100 uh, studies on. These are the average, no? At least uh, five studies. I averaged the five studies. The content on the on the precursors of fly ash and metacholine and also slag, and also the chemical compositions. No, we have the we have the first one, which is the silicon, silicate, and also aluminate, no? And then also the iron. And if if we would if we are going to 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 analyze this, no, you see that majority of the chemical uh, content of fly ash is this silicate and aluminate you see this is around this is around 80% no 80% for metacholine this is also the same the trend is the same the uh, silicate and aluminate content is around 90% for slag there's a slight difference no there's a light dif slight difference because in slag uh, the, the the major content is on calcium so so this slag resembles to that of the properties of cement, the ordinary Portland cement, and also some of the some of the uh, 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 compositions you see here. So uh, these are coming from previous studies, in which we can also use this as a reference in the future studies. And before before uh, before this can be this can be uh, applied or it can be cured it needs to be activated no so i have listed here common common alkaline activator that we can use no for fly ash we can also use for metacholine also for slag and also a combinations of the three no now if we have fly ash we can uh, uh, most of the studies they use they use uh, sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide no? they use this one and these are some of the ratio that they use no this is the the effective one, I mean to say the optimum one. And when we when we are going to have a metacholine, the sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide combination will work. Potassium silicate and potassium hydroxide also will work. So you can choose either of them. So I have used sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide, and now we are planning potassium silicate and potassium hydroxide to use that one. Now for slag, you will see that you can use uh, sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide as well as also sodium silicate and and uh, calcium hydroxide and also sodium silicate and potassium hydroxide no? now if you combine them 30% 30% or 40% then you can use sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide so by looking on this the common alkaline activator that we use is usually sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide and you can buy this uh, this is already available in some of the of the, uh, in the in the industry we can buy this one that if you would like to 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 make a geopolymer concrete or mortar so these are the example of a lean geopolymer you know we do not have yet here application of the frgc it's only i mean a lean a lean geopolymer no without fiber reinforcement so this has been used already in 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 practical applications for example in 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 australia in the University of Queensland Global Change Institute, they are using geopolymer already in constructing the building. No? This is a Toy Story building, and then they use, uh, for example, this concrete. This is made from uh, geopolymer concrete. And also in the US, they also applied geopolymer concrete in uh, the temple in Chicago, no? and uh, they applied this uh, this material actually on the foundation part. Because uh, later on, uh, the 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 advantage of using is because it has high corrosion, no? high high corrosion resistance. So another application also is in bridge structures. No, geopolymer also was used in construction of bridge in Australia as well as also in Denmark. They also use this. 
and in the Philippines, there are also lots of lots of applications of FRGC of, of geopolymer. No? They use that in the, I think in Cebu, the Cordoba, ex, the new bridge in, in Cebu, uh, the Cordoba, something, the Cordoba bridge. Uh, they are also using, they also used geopolymer material. Now let's go after the, the mortar, uh, we'll go to the, to the type or the common uh, material used as fiber reinforcement. So, so I just listed here the common one. No? We have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So around seven uh, fibers, synthetic fibers that are being used in FRGC. No? And these are the properties also. And I also get this from the previous uh, studies and then I summarize them. And we have the steel fiber. We also have the PBA fiber. We also have we we also have polyethylene. We also have poly, polypropylene, carbon fiber, glass fiber, and basalt fiber. And they are uh, they are uh, categorized into two. No, Cate major category is that macro fiber and also micro fiber. Now, usually for macro fiber, no, the diameter here is around 1,000 micrometer, or that is one millimeter. No? So usually steel fibers are macro fiber. But if you have a diameter which is only around seven or 30 micrometer, these are considered now as micro fiber. No? That includes PVA, polyethylene, polypropylene, carbon, glass, and basalt, no? that one. And also you can also find here some properties, the density, and then the tensile property, the tensile, uh, the tensile uh, strength, and then the elongation of break. So you can find this uh, uh, material, and and these are actually coming from the industry. No, they specify the the properties uh, based on the available fiber that they have. And we'll go on to some of the typical strength of FRGC. No? So I also summarize some of the. Uh, completed researches, no? those are published uh, project, published uh, researches, and I summarize them, and then I also have here the combination, list of combination, if you have a precursor of fly ash, and then combine with fiber type, and then the type of curing, the number of days, then you can get here the value, no? the value. So you can have a value here that ranges from around 40 megapascal, no? this is around 40 megapascal, up to as high as, I think, as high as 83 megapascal. But what I would like to highlight here is that, you see here, there is an increase, no? You have here. So that means that if I'm going to add, no? if I'm going to add fiber into the mortar, into the geopolymer mortar, the tendency is it might also contribute to increase the strength, the compressive strength of the composite now, the FRGC. So that is if we use fly ash and also this combination. No? You also have a combination of fly ash and metacholine and then paired with polypropylene. So they will surely increase the compressive strength. But this is not always the case, just like this one. Because they found out also from these studies, okay, from these studies that if a fly ash and also a polypropylene cured at this, at, at this temperature, they found out that when you add fiber, it actually decreases the compressive strength. That is according to this study. So also if your fly ash and, and mix this with slag and cured with around 85 degrees Celsius, also the value of the compressive strength will be reduced. And also, Another one is you have, if if, if you apply also slag paired with polyethylene, this will also reduce the compressive strength. And slag also paired with carbon, this will also decrease the compressive strength. So that means that not all of the time, no, that all of the time, that when you add fiber on the mortar, it will increase, it will lead to increase in compressive strength. So you always have to do the testing. However, if in case your if in case your uh, material, say I say material is just like this, then you can make this as a reference that indeed it can increase the compressive strength. And then with regards to thin cell properties, so also a combination. These are also coming from different different uh, studies. And if you com 
combined with several precursors and also with type of fibers and then the curing days, either ambient, meaning say room temperature, or it is heat cured, you can get the value here. And then you will notice that regardless, okay, regardless of the type of fiber, the type of precursor, the type of curing, the type of the number of days of curing, you will still get an increase in the tensile strength. So that is the that is the advantage when you put tensile and when you put a, a fiber into the mortar, it will increase the tensile strength, basing from the uh, studies conducted. And so you can get up to 261% increase huh, from this one if you use slag. And, and and steel, and then you cure this at um, at uh, room temperature. Then you can you can also you can get around two hundred sixty one percent increase. But uh, the message here is clear that adding a uh, fiber to mortar will increase the tensile strength. Now the other one also is the flexural properties. Now for flexural properties, there are two flexural properties here. Huh? The flexural strength, this one. Let me change this one. And, and. So the increase in flexural strength, this one. Ah, sorry, the, the flexural strength and also the toughness. No? So when we say toughness, this is actually the ability, the ability to absorb energy. And this is very important, especially if you are going to design your structure, if it is it is subjected to dynamic loading such as earthquake because we need we need to we need to ensure that that structure can absorb energy and even ductility also it should it should demonstrate uh, enough ductility to hold this load and also if we compare this no if if we analyze this one you will see that different uh, precursors no combination of precursor ply ash metacholine or calcine clay and also uh, slag then paired with different, you will notice here that uh, the increase, there is actually a, a positive effect. No, I see here, a positive effect. The increase is from uh, around, let us say, around 30% uh, up to 276%. That is the increase. And also, you will also see here that although there are some are not, uh, some values did not, uh, some, some studies did not uh, report the values, but you will see that you have here a positive, uh, a positive effect on the toughness. No? You have 264, you have 151, 1,500, and also it even can increase up to 2,110. So if I'm going to summarize, you know, if I'm going to summarize on the mechanical properties, surely it will increase the tensile strength, the flexural strength, and the flexural toughness. However, when it comes to compressive strength of FRGC, sometimes it also increases, sometimes it reduces. No? So that, that, that is the, that is the uh, findings that we can get from, from, from a series of studies already being conducted, which we can use in our reference. Now, why, why, we, why we can use, no? why we can use FRGC? Why we can use FRGC? to make our structure more sustainable. No? So I'm going to show you the advantage of using FRGC. No? Although there has been, there has been a, a debate regarding uh, this, uh, this statement, statement, because according to Lee, if we use uh, geopolymer, or meaning to say fly ash or, or metacholine or also uh, slag-based uh, uh, geopolymer, the carbon emission can be reduced by 80% compared to that of the OPC. No? That's according to Lee. And we know from the fact that when we use OPC, the production of OPC, for every kilogram of cement, we emit one kilogram also of carbon dioxide. And the global emission, the, the global uh, contribution, the, the contribution of, of production of cement is in global, in carbon emission, uh, uh, emission of carbon is actually by 7%, no? and we would like this to be reduced. And uh, and also, this is one of the advantage why using, why uh, we can make 
uh, we can make a sustainable infrastructure by using FRTC. And then when it comes to the physical and mechanical properties, no, sometimes no, uh, the compressive strength of, of FRGC or let's say poly, uh, geopolymer co concrete or geopolymer mortar compared to OPC, they are, they are also comparable. But sometimes they are even better. No? For example, this study here on the left by, by Lo et al. in 2008, you will see that Using geopolymer, you can get up to around 75 megapascal. No? This is around 75 megapascal. Now, in the Philippines, we, we have to use at least 21 megapascal or 22 megapascal compressive strength of, compressive strength of concrete no? for our design. And also in the study of Lloyd and Ragan, you see that uh, uh, using geopolymer concrete, we can reach up to around 65 megapascal. No? So that means that we uh, strength-wise, we can we can tailor our geopolymer mortar so that it can also satisfy the requirement of the code, which is around 21 or 22 megapascal. Now they even have they, they even have developed a what we call ultra high performance geopolymer. For example, in Iowa State University, no, they develop a UHPG, and they were able to to develop a 100 megapascal uh, geopolymer concrete compressive strength no this is almost ultra ultra and also super no? and also high performance concrete and then another study also no? of course uh, these are basically the work of a materials engineer you no know, in which you can develop or or even uh, i would say uh, a yeah, chemist no you can also develop this one because we really need you to do this so that we can apply in structural uh, structural engineering or in or in construction now another study also conducted by Wu et al they also put polyphosphate no? i'm not familiar with polyphosphate however when they put polyphosphate onto the geopolymer no? the mortar you are able to get around 60, 160 megapascal no? this is 160 megapascal by varying by varying the amount of the polyphosphate another advantage also of of fr frgc or polymer, polymer uh, mortar is that it performs better in fire no because of their ceramic properties they are more durable at elevated temperature for example uh, geopolymer mortar can withstand up to 1500 degrees celsius no 1500 degrees celsius for normal concrete, you, or that is a cement-based concrete, it can only stand up to 100, mega, 100 degrees Celsius. If it is subjected to 200 degrees Celsius, it can no longer, and then the, lo, the, the capacity of that will be reduced tremendously. No? There is degradation of the performance already. So see the difference here. It's around 15, 15 times, no? 15 times uh, resistant in fire compared to that of the OPC. And then also, uh, geopolymer also, as compared to cement-based uh, material, they have, uh, they are demo they demonstrated a high band performance, no? band performance between the geopolymer to that of the concrete no? substrate, if you'd like to repair. So for example, this one, no? the comparison. Okay, so you have a higher, this is for cement, concrete, this is for geopolymer. And you see here that the band strength at 28 days is only 1.95, but for geopolymer concrete is, is 3.04. We need to say it has a better resist, this, it has a better uh, connectivity, no? In 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 common term, that is connectivity between between geopolymer to that of the concrete. They can stick, no? Much better compared to concrete to concrete. And also geopolymer also has better better uh, band to steel bars. You see here. They also have better band to steel bars, okay? And that one, that one, uh, uh, those are with regards to the band strength. And they also, geopolymer also shown to have lower creep and shrinkage, meaning to say they have less, uh, they have less cracks, no? At same load, they have less crack compared to that of, compared to that of the cement-based concrete, no? So if you compare here, uh, for, for 67 megapascal of, 
67 megapascal or 60 megapascal of, of, uh, uh, of geopolymer, you only have around 15, no? 15 uh, uh, creek. But if you have for, for ordinary Portland cement, you have around 50 to 60. So this is very important, especially if you would like to, to reduce the crack. No? So because if your application is on, for example, on water storage, and you don't like that your, that your uh, structure have, in a, have cracks, so you can use geopolymer concrete or geopolymer mortar in that case. And also the shown to have superior performance in, in, in uh, sulfate attacks and also in corrosion, in other words, corrosion. Geopolymer is more corrosive resistant. No, this is more corrosive resistant compared to that of, of, of a cement base. So uh, this is very ideal if you are going to use this material in harsh environment, for example, in the shoreline, or even if it's exposed to, to corrosion, no? you can use geopolymer rather than the ordinary Portland cement base. And also, <clears throat> geopolymer is eight times higher corrosion. So that means to say, you can, uh, you can uh, have a design of 250 years life of, of geopolymer concrete. Okay, that's the one, 250 years. You can design up to 250 years. And on the lighter side, this is about workability. No? So this is a fly ash. This is the mineralogy, morphology, morphology of raw materials. This is your fly ash and this is your cement. So, so in comp comparison with, with the workability, when, when you work with them, you need to say, if you're going to shovel them, no? you can easily uh, shovel uh, fly ash with less effort compared to that of cement because uh, the composition of fly ash is this is a ball bearing no this is a spherical and spherical um, uh, particles help this this serve as a ball bearing if you're going to work them compared to that of a cement this has actually some tetrahedron or there are some uh, polyhe polyhedron or this angular so sometimes also difficult or it actually there's a resistance but for fly ash, it doesn't have resistance because it is in the shape of ball bearing. No? Those are one. And in the context of FRGC, meaning to say we have now the fiber. Okay, So we have now the fiber. Now, if you use this fiber, you have the improved tensile, as I have discussed. You have a good tensile and flexural performance. And you also have the high toughness. And you also have the ductility. Okay, So the reason why this is so is because uh, the use of, of short fibers are they actually bridge no they actually bridge the crack or sometimes they also delay the occurrence of crack they try to hold together and in that case they increase the tensile strength just like this one huh? so in this case for example you have here around you can increase the strength by around 600 no and also you can increase the toughness by around 2000 and again this toughness is very important because if you design buildings subjected by ground excitation or earthquake, you need to, to prepare that your structure should absorb energy. So by, by, by looking on this, this is also a potential material, especially in retrofitting or making a structure which are exposed to earthquake, just like the Philippines, no? that one. And when it comes to, to ductility, see? ductility is the ability of the material or the structure to, to, to deform after yielding. That's why we have the steel bars. Because if we have only the, if you only have the concrete, then uh, there's no, there's no, uh, uh, if it fails, there's no sign that it will fail. No? It will fail abruptly and we don't have time to run away. So that's why we need to have steel bars. Because steel bars, we can say that, uh, it also provides the sign that it will collapse. No? That's, the, that's, the, that's the role of ductility. So uh, this is uh, an example of, of a, a test by Almay GD on, on steel, uh, steel fiber or PBE fiber. And then this is the stress strain curve. And I'll, let me show you one example. For example, this one. You see here that this is the curve. No? So that is the, that is the, uh, that is the, mechanics or the, the behavior if you have fiber. Because if you don't have fiber, after reaching the peak, no? After reaching the peak, it will just grow, it will, the, it will uh, drop abruptly. 
So that will happen. We need to say if this is your design and then you use without fiber, automatically all of you will fall down also. That's why we really need this one. Huh? And ductility is the is actually the ratio between this value here, no? this value, divided by this value. Okay, that's the ductility. So these are the these are the uh, significance also. Now, if our GC, no, if our GC is still new in the application, practical applications, although in the in the last decades you can see a lot, a lot of a lot, a lot of, of projects going on, but uh, mostly or almost all of them, this study is concentrated on the material sites. I need to say. We need to say they only characterize the material side. However, if you apply this in practical applications, which we would like, you cannot find really, really much regarding this application. So, uh, uh, although I have found some applications for this one, no? for example, uh, if FRGC has been used now in, in Canada and Australia, Canada and US, no? they use the FRGC. However, okay, the application of this is simply to to improve or strengthen uh, uh, concrete sewer pipe, for example, this one, no? you will see that there are some degradation, no? there are also some damage, and so they repaired this using FRGC. No? This is the this is the result after uh, spraying spraying with F FRGC. Okay, and the reason why they use FRGC again is because FRGC are corrosion resistant, no? and usually if you have some water here, no. If you store some water, or if there are water running across this this area here, this will be exposed to corrosion, and therefore they think that using FRGC, which is corrosion resistant, will will actually solve this issue or problem. That's why they use FRGC. No? And also in 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 Canada, also they use this uh, FRGC to to rehabilitate box culvert. You see that there are some already exposure of steel bars. Okay, and also there are some uh, corrosion on steel bars, no? degradation. So definitely there will be some degradation in strength of this one. And so the, the, the proposed for a solution by putting or rehabilitating this using FRGC. No? And I think all of these are, they use uh, sprayed, sprayed FRGC, no? pressurized, pressurized pump, and then they spray that one. And this is the original, original, uh, uh, Rehabilitate uh, original rectangular box, no? and then after that, the repair this, and then this is the one. No? Okay, and also in Germany, no, in Germany they also apply FR, FRGC, uh, G, uh, geopolymer concrete, no? geopolymer mortar, FRGC. They also use FRGC, but this time, the uh, the application is on a concrete dam. No, they apply it on concrete dam. So they use this one in Germany, and then of course they characterize several uh, several properties before they apply this one. And you know this is the setup. You see some cracks here, okay? Some deteriorations of concrete, and also masonry, may probably masonry. And then they apply the FRGC, and then the he use here using sprayed uh, FRGC. No, they spray that one, and this is the. And this is the uh, sh uh, the surface of the tree of the uh, sprayed uh, sprayed surface, no? Using FRGC, okay. And they are still and they are still monitoring on the long term performance because you know as I've said, the application of FRGC is still new. So the question there is about long term performance and also durability. That's why they monitor the performance of this uh, of this uh, technology in Germany. Now, when we're going to build an environment, a sustainable uh, built environment that should be sustainable, we need also to ensure that the existing built environment, no? the existing buildings should also be sustainable. Meaning to say, we need to retain them, and we need uh, we need to to safeguard their safety, as as well as also we need to 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 ensure that the original uh, purpose of why they are there should be preserved, no. And uh, one of the one of the aspects is that they should be preserved and they should be rehabilitated, so that so that they become more sustainable. And of course, this will also contribute to sustainable environment. No, we we, we cannot we cannot just live there. We cannot just live them and also uh, 
and also demolish them. We need also to preserve them. For example, if we have historical buildings, no? if we have Baraswa in church, although they have been there for so many times, we cannot remove them because they have also historical impact for us. So we need to rehabilitate them. And uh, FRGC are a potential, are a potential, uh, are a potential uh, material that can be used because of, because of the, because of the, uh, of the uh, inherent advantages. No? So, for example, if your building will look like this one, no? there are some degradation. Okay, actually, this is from this is a, this is a building in in Italy, no? In Italy, and then they already did the study on how to rehabilitate this one, and also if your if your building is subjected to fire or under fire, and then and you need also if you if you can still if you can still uh, rehabilitate them, then you can you can do that one. If not, then you can demolish. But uh, as much as we can, we need we can we need to preserve them, and also for for bridge. I think this is a bridge, and then the pier. No, this is the pier. You see that there are some some uh, degradation of strength. There are some spalling of concrete. You see here, this spalling of concrete, and also exposure of reinforcement. And if it's exposed, then you will see some corrosion. So we need to rehabilitate them. And even if uh, it is not that worst, sometimes also we need also to we need also to protect them against uh, disastrous uh, disastrous phenomena. Just like earthquakes, we also have typhoon, and these are these are really happening to us. No, for example, last time I vis I, I was there in I was there in Southern Leyte. No, we we went there with ASIP team to to check the the integrity of the buildings in Southern Leyte in Ormuk. We went there, and you see that 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 uh, uh, buildings there, including including school buildings, no, were damaged. Okay, they are damaged. We check this one, and also. Earthquakes happened in Cebu, in Bohol, and even in Mindanao area, in the Philippines area. You see that Iran. So before this happens, we need to we need to plan so that uh, we can improve the we can improve uh, the the performance and we can rehabilitate or even strengthen them in order to cater the 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 current demand of demand of the building or the demand of the codes. So that's why we need to rehabilitate them. So in the past two years, no, in the past two years, in 2019, I started working on the rehabilitation project on how FRGC can be used, no. So this is actually my this actually my recent study uh, uh, on how 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 structural elements can still be preserved if possible, and then how it can be done, no. So for example, if you have this type of frame. This is, uh, I think, a degraded one. And if you would like to, if you would like to uh, uh, strengthen them, this is the column. You can also do that one. No? But in my case, I focus first on the uh, the behavior or the uh, rehabilitation behavior of a degraded or uh, deteriorated beam. No. So how I'm going to do this? Okay, that is the application. So what I did is. First, I need to characterize. I need to I need to optimize the, the 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 proportion and also optimize the strength of the of the if our if our if our uh, if our GC no or mortar or the fiber reinforced geopolymer mortar composites. Okay, so uh, what I did is I actually simplified one. No, I I use a fly ash here. Okay, a fly ash, then also with uh, alkaline activator with sand. I see this is this becomes now the mortar okay and then the reinforcement is actually from from uh, PVA polyvinyl alcohol and also from steel fibers the reason why i use this one because this is microfiber this is macrofiber and if you hybridize them together they will provide you a more a more improved a more improved contribution rather than only using a PVA or using only steel fibers that's called hybridization and then this is the properties of the sand. And then I use uh, activator sodium silicon and also sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide. And these are some of the properties here. I use the this is the mixture. No, is the mixture. And then around uh, two percent volume. Okay. Then from this, I characterize the the mechanical properties. This is also needed because 
if you are going to do analytical studies, then you need to have the properties. So I, I have a trial mixture and then uh, made some, uh, made some uh, casting. This is for calculations of compressive strength and also the thin cell strength, this dog bone. Then after cured for 28 days, then I do the test and then finally get, finally got the properties, no? so here. So this is the test. This is compression test, then mounted by uh, some instrument. And then you have the, the, the failure mode. And this is the curve, no? This is the curve, this is the stress strain curve. And uh, what I can say here is that uh, usually, usually for, for mortar cement base, you have this curve type, no? This is a hyperbolic, uh, the parabolic type, okay? This is the testing, this is for this is the expected uh, stress strain curve for mortar only without fiber. And if you see, if you compare this one, it looks the same. No? It looks the same. So we can say now that, uh, we can conclude now that the effect of, of, fiber, of, of fibers no, in FRGC doesn't really, doesn't really change. It doesn't change the, doesn't change the, uh, the stress strain curve when, when when you put additional fibers here because they're almost the same that is the conclusion we can we can uh, have here but on the other hand when we go to thin cell strength no this is thin cell strength you also have here instrumented and then you see that the cracks here is located on a major crack my macro cracks on the center of the specimen no you see here that you have although this is possible this is actually in initial initial uh, initial stiffness no the this is uncracked here okay then after cracking it reduces but even if it reduces sorry even it reduces it still provide <clears throat> it still provide a contribution on the strength no you still have strength here now if you don't have fiber the tendency is after cracking, the the load will automatically become zero. No, sorry. Okay, sorry for that. Are you are you are you hearing me now? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Ah, okay, sorry. So, <clears throat> now let me go back to the <clears throat> to the behavior here. You see here that even even it cracks, it can still hold. It can still provide additional load. However, if you don't have here reinforcement then the tendency is automatically this becomes zero, no? This will happen if you do a test of concrete in tensile, no? <clears throat> There's no tensile. There's no tensile capacity, uh, around 8%, but it's almost negligible. With regards to <clears throat> the strengthening application, this is what I did. <clears throat> so, so starting from casting, starting from uh, making of the reinforcement bars and then putting and then casting also <clears throat> that is a uh, casting up specimen of concrete up to curing of concrete rc beam now in denmark <clears throat> because they already have sophisticated equipment here what you need only to do is to put some cement and also some 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 sand or gravel and then <clears throat> water will be flowed in using uh, i would say uh, Automate, uh, automated control, no? 
they have automate they have control here you just press in a certain amount of a certain amount of value of of water then you don't have to to get some water and put it inside <clears throat> it's not necessary anymore <clears throat> So after uh, curing, after uh, 28 days, I start now the roughening. No? You have to rough the surface here. What is interesting here is you don't really have to have a, an expensive or sophisticated uh, equipment to roughen the surface. <clears throat> I only use here a, a needle scaler. No? This is a needle scaler, or even you can use chisel if you want. You can use chisel or any material just to roughen them. Then after roughening, I sprayed and cleaned them. No? Then after that, I prepared the, I prepared the repair material or strengthening materials. This strengthening material is based from the trial, trial mixture that I've, that I've made. No? And then pouring of the repair material. And this is the <clears throat> condition of the repaired material. Uh, the repaired, uh, strengthened, repaired or strengthened RC beams. No? You see here that this side here is the RC beam. And this is this area here is the FRGC. No? Then after curing of the of the specimen, <clears throat> uh, this is the uh, configurations. I use here uh, bottom jacketing. No, this is bottom jacketing. I also put some F FRGC on the sides and also put FRGC on the three sides. And I would say this is RC control. This is S1J. This is S2J and this is S3J. No? This is one side, two sides, three sides. Then I'll do the testing also. <clears throat> After that, I do the testing. I put some, I put some uh, strain gauge to record to, to, to record the strain and also some uh, LBDT you know, to monitor the deformation and do that here and do the test before I. Do the test, or before even before I do, I cast the specimen. I have I check that the the type of failure here should be just like a beam. So <clears throat> I compare that with the with the ACI code, and then I check the A over D. No, the A over D, and uh, uh, it was observed that the value of A over D is greater than 2.5. That means that we are expecting to have a flexural type failure. And this is also this is also uh, apparent because uh, I, I noticed that the failure, the, the final failure mode of the tested specimens are actually crashing of concrete. No? Now, if you are designing beam, if you are teaching RCD, reinforced concrete beam, or reinforced concrete design, uh, usually the, 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 the typical failure of, of RC beam should be crashing of concrete at the top. No? This is crashing of concrete at the top. So by 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 observing this, uh, I would say that uh, the the testing plan that I that I've made uh, basically uh, follows to that of the requirement of ACI and also uh, ensuring that the failure is just like of the beam. Now let us <clears throat> I will just give you some some uh, a brief result for this. No, uh, first cracking. If we compare them them the first cracking uh, first cracking here. So you will see here that this is your reference reference beam. <clears throat> this is without jackets, without strengthening. And if you put one side on the bottom, you will improve by 94%. No? You will increase by 94%. And if you put two sides here, you will, imp you will improve the cracking by 101%. <clears throat> and if you put uh, uh, FRGC on the bottom, and if you put R FRGC on the two sides, you will get around 167 increase. No? So apparent, uh, clearly here that when you apply bottom two sides and three sides, the cracking performance will be enhanced by at least 94%. Then why, why, we, why we really need to, to have this one? <clears throat> why is it that this is, why is it that uh, uh, this is an advantage when you use FRDC? Now, because if you put this one, and if you would like to, if you would like to protect the steel bars, no? for example, if it is corroded, and if you put FRGC, it actually have lesser crack. So you don't have enough cracks. That is the interpretation of this. You don't have enough cracks so that water cannot penetrate them. No? So this is, a, <clears throat> this is a 
a good sign that if our GC can perform as a good strengthening materials. Another one also is when it comes to yielding load, no? So yielding load is that is yielding of, of steel bars usually in RC beam. And uh, by using the by using the the bottom and the middle, the two, two sides and three sides, your yielding load can be increased from 21%, 24% up to 62%. No? This is increasing also. <clears throat> Likewise, for the load performance, which I think is very important because this is the one that we're going to use in the design. Now, the ultimate load is that's the last, the last load before, before actually it fails, no? Here. That is the a simple interpretation or the simple definition of failure load. So if you use a, a NSIJ or if you use uh, jackets on the bottom, your load, your capacity, I would say capacity, will be improved by 21%. Now, if you put on the two sides, your capacity will be improved, improved up to 36%. And then if you put three sides, your capacity will be 62% increased. No? So it again increases here. That's the trend. Okay. <clears throat> now, with regards to ductility, ductility is uh, the ability again to form. And if you are designing the building, you need to ensure that your structure should have enough ductility. So you will see that if SIJ is used, there is a reduction of around 7%. Right? And sometimes also, if 7%, we, we can still accept this as part because in the margin of error, we sometimes use around positive and negative 10%. That's the margin of error. So uh, I would say that even if it reduced by 7%, it still can be considered as also com uh, comparable with that of the RCP. And also for two sides, you also have an increase, even increased the three percent of that one. So uh, this can only be, I would say, this can only be uh, described or this can only be discussed uh, if we know the mechanics of materials. No, and this one, why this is increased by three percent as compared to this one. However, if we use S3J, no, if we use S3J it will be reduced by around 11% no? if you use S3J. Sometimes uh, you have to balance them because not all of the times that your design should be higher load, you should also balance them that it should have also enough ductility. So even if this is negative 11, but it's still within the range of the allowable ductility, then still you can use S3J. No? That's, that's the basis of that one. And also for absorbed energy. <clears throat> In order to get the absorbed energy, no, uh, you have to integrate, or I would say, what, what up it is now? Sorry, this one. This is the curve. This is the load. This is the displacement, no, the distance, and this is also the load. Okay. So this is the curve of the load displacement. Okay, that one. Now, usually, in order to obtain the absorbed energy, what you need to do is to find this area. Okay. Example that one. So you can use integral calculus, or you can use Newton Simpson's rule, or also trapezoidal rule. You have to find. So that's what I've got this one. And if we compare, if we compare this one J, and this two J and this three J, you see that also increases. Okay, this also increases. So you make the material, or you make the RC, the unstrength, or the original structure more absorbent, energy absorbent when you put this one. So that means that really, really this material can be used, especially if your structure is subjected to earthquake loading, because we need to have the ductility and also the absorbed energy. <clears throat> now, when you when you develop, uh, usually we cannot use right away. You know, we cannot use right away experiment results. You cannot use that one. When you design building, we don't need, we don't use uh, experiments. Okay, values. What we need in designing is we need to use a formula. For example, if you are familiar, if you are a civil engineer, students or a civil engineer, you are familiar with what we call the reinforcement ratio that is called RAW. Okay, and with the RAW, you will be able to use maximum maximum a moment that is MU, M ultimate from that one. And then if you have the M ultimate, you will be able to solve the sections of the beam as well as also the steel bars. <clears throat> the 
that is the practical application. We can, we don't we don't we cannot use experiments. We cannot use also other except if you have a value. And in order this to be more <clears throat> applicable, I I I I, 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 I uh, proposed a formula. Okay, a formula so that we can predict the ultimate capacity of that one. And that's called the prediction of ultimate moment capacity. This is a simplified one by just uh, taking some of the <clears throat> some of the principles, basic principles as well as those that are uh, those are uh, available in ACI. So I use also a reference from ACI. And these are the in order for me to, to develop a prediction model, okay, I need to have the individual material model. Okay. So so this is the material model for concrete and compression. This is the material model for, for steel, okay? And this is also the material model for FRGC. <clears throat> if you remember a while ago, the form, the, the, the stress strain or the shape of the FRGC looks like this one. So that's why I pattern it there. And also for the FRGC intention, you also have to like this one. So these four materials, material model we use, then after that, I develop some uh, diagram, stress strain force distribution, then put some of the contribution here. And finally, I was able to develop some of the formula. No? These, are not really, <clears throat> these are not really difficult to work on because this is more simplified. No? This is simplified. So for example, <clears throat> if you have a beam, okay, if you have a beam, and then you put additional uh, material just like this one, all you need to do is simply to use this formula, and then you can get the, the capacity of that. Okay, that is that. I know that some of the attendants here, some of the participants are not civil engineer. Okay, that's why I, I would like to relate that into your into your uh, area. So that is the meaning. And then you have here some of the important parameters you put here, and finally you can get the, the capacity. So <clears throat> for this material, material uh, for this uh, for this particular uh, 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 sections, if somebody will ask you, okay, how much can that structure hold? So you will say, ah, that is the value. It's because this is taken from here, okay? That's also the same if, you, if your material or if your RC beam is re, uh, strengthened by two sides and also three sides, okay? Now, sometimes we cannot just simply propose. <clears throat> you cannot propose somebody a formula which is not, uh, which is not verified. So to do that, I also verify, I compare the value in the, this is theoretical, no? This is the theoretical one based from this one. And then I compared also with the experimental and take the ratio. And uh, you will see here that the difference is in the range of 5 to 7.1%. And in, in the engineering perspective, we accept this kind of margin of error. Okay, Margin is up to 10%. So we can accept. This means that uh, this 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 uh, proposed formula can be used in order to predict the 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 moment capacity of the retrofitted one. <clears throat> now this one is only valid no if you are going to find the ultimate moment. Okay, you can use that formula. But if you would like to extend more, you would like to to find the properties, the the toughness, then you have to go with this. Uh, I I I I. Uh, Proposed also some analytical studies, but this one is more complicated just to give you an idea. Because from here, we will be calculating the ductility, we'll be calculating the energy absorption, and then you can also <clears throat> you can also change the parameters. For example, what will happen if my concrete is has poor compressive strength? If my concrete is high strength, if my steel is only 10 millimeter, or if my steel is 100 millimeter. Ah, no, sorry, 100 millimeter, uh, 25 millimeter, what will happen? So without doing some experiment, all you can do is simply to have to use this formula, okay? And then you can use an Excel or even MATLAB and then play around. And then you can now find the, the, the value of what you're looking for by using that. <clears throat> now, uh, currently I have project with the La Salle University. Huh? We are uh, we are making some we are enhancing some of the some of the properties of <clears throat> some of the properties of FRGC no? and the, luckily we are funded by the DOST shared no this is with the 
this around this this two prog this program receive funding by around 17 uh, 16.6 million no but these are there are two projects here and one of the component project is the development of the development of <clears throat> a more enhanced uh, frgc okay so this is uh, the, the the intention here is to so that we can use in the philippines this uh, technology for historical buildings no? churches and also uh, modern historical buildings for buildings for example capitals those are made for example of concrete so we can also use this one that's what we're going and <clears throat> i have collaboration with uh, several professors in de la salle dr jason ongping of structural engineering and also doc dr garciano no some of you might 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 know them and also doc mike i think you know you know doc mike because I, he has also projects in also projects in mindanao area and we are collaborating with nhcp dpwh and also dust ptri and also brs and our team is composed of around more or less around 18 no <clears throat> 10 faculty and eight postgrad students now we have i think we have five five phds and four four ms with this one <clears throat> and we try to enhance no <clears throat> we try to enhance uh, this is the this is the uh, this is the uh, per performance or response if i use if rgc okay that is the performance and then we can also we have also have what we call frg grid no? carbon we put that one now carbon usually are brittle so this just go here okay now what we would like to do is actually to hybridize them no? to combine them so that we can you see here that if you use only frg grid you don't have ductility just like glass you know when you step on the glass you should be uh, i would say you you will be frightened because you don't know when it will collapse isn't it so that is the properties also of, of carbon no you don't know whether it will collapse or not you don't have sign so but you have a a good potential here of improving the strength <clears throat> here you can have around like this one but if our gc only have smaller value smaller uh, amount of load that can be sustained but they are ductile meaning to say they can tell you that oh you my structure will collapse so the concept now is why don't we combine this one so that we can get a value like this it actually provided a higher a higher uh, load capacity at the same time you also have ductility so we try to combine them and it's now it's now uh, on progress no? we are doing some uh, studies element uh, on characterizations of the material and so on and so forth so hopefully this will this will be completed on the i think last quarter of 2023 <clears throat> now i also have some initiatives no i also have done some initiatives in connecting with people connecting with uh, with the PUP, connecting with other universities, connecting with CSU, Caraga, and then MSU also. I would like to connect with those universities and then do some researches, projects that will be funded either by the UST, for example, and also international. So that is one of the, that is, those are one of the initiatives that I've conducted. And currently I <clears throat> have, have proposal discussions on how to to establish uh, a 3D printed FRGC. No, <clears throat> this is FRGC, uh, fiber reinforced geopolymer concrete or mortar. We can use FRGC in making an infrastructures like this one, but using now 3D printed. You know, uh, unfortunately, our research in the Philippines when it comes to 3D printed in concrete, I would say in concrete is almost zero now. I don't know, but I think almost zero that's why that's why we 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 are initiating some some uh some proposals actions so that we can start at least we cannot compare this uh technology in in singapore in india but we can start so that's why i have the initiative of having this now in netherlands they already have a 3d printed house no this this might be available to you but it is now existing okay this is a 3d printed house and uh, you know the difference is that the difference that the time of, of of building the house i think the the build this house uh the difference is 
much, much higher, much longer. Now, the time of preparation is uh, compared to that when you build this manually, no? So it reduces a lot of, a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of, uh, of time. You can reduce that one. Only that, uh, of course, uh, you have to invest here. And also, in in Madrid, no, in Spain, they also uh, have the first 3D printed pedestrian bridge. Okay, this is made from 3D printing. And also in in Australia, they also started. And also in Netherlands, in Belgium, in Denmark here. And also in India and also in China, they have lots of researches, but not in the Philippines. And so I, <clears throat> I started initiating this one, and we are now on initial talks with the Pisser DST, and uh, I think they will be. They are, uh, <clears throat> they accept this technology. Of course, we need to develop more and, and have initial discussion with uh, Bataan Peninsula State University. We started, then we make the proposal, and we hope that. Uh, we hope I can involve more universities to join this team, but still it is in the process of development. And let's see what will happen. So now we cannot we cannot build houses using 3D printed, but we can build, uh, I would say miniature, for example, protections of shorelines. We can also put that one. That is, that is, that is called, is it tetrahedron? Something like that one. We can use that one, okay? <clears throat> now aside from, Aside from uh, FRGC, specific FRGC, I'm also connecting FRGC to other applications. No? So I also uh, propose, no? I also propose an initiative and then partner with universities. And then one of the, one of the uh, proposal that I made, of course, we initiate them mutually is the Center for Earthquake Engineering. Now, it's now in the process. And then the, the, the goal of this is to conduct R&D trainings, give professional advice, contribute in safeguarding the built environment against the effect of earthquake in Luzon, in Visayas, in Mindanao. I know that uh, UP Diliman, they already have sophisticated, they have the, the equipment already for this. And so we, <clears throat> we try to, we try to uh, collaborate with DOST so that uh, DOST preserved, particular DOST preserved, so that we can realize this and this will cater Visayas and Mindanao area. And we know this is, will be very, significant because we are always under earthquake that one we can also develop potentials for researchers and everything here and uh, now we we already have initial initial uh, meetings and everything with Cebu Technological University we also have the USTP third that is also onboarding and then we already have VBOX no and the UP Diliman we are inviting UP Diliman also and we would like also that uh, Universities in Luzon, besides, I mean, that will be involved this one. And hopefully the meeting will be successful. Now we start, it will be <clears throat> next week and then we plan and then we submit a proposal and then hopefully this will be funded. That is for the, that is for the uh, advantage also of researchers and universities and other industries in the Philippines. Now, if we would like to do some collaborative projects, then uh, I, I will give you some, some uh, uh, advantages of why we need to use FRGC. Because from here, we will be able to know the application. No? I know that you have lots of ideas, but at least this one will also guide you where is the application. Because you cannot propose, you cannot propose a, certain, uh, a certain material or you cannot propose a certain system if it cannot provide you a it cannot provide you a, a advantage, you know. So we have to exploit and explore also the advantage. For example, it has good band strength. You can also use this one. And you also have this is also have high fire fire resistance. We need to say in the US, you no, know, in the US, in NASA, they use this as a platform. They use FR uh, geopolymer mortar in. In, in launching of NASA, no shuttle, in spaceship, they also put that one because they has uh, have high high fire resistance, you know, around 1,500. So they also they also did some experiment here, and also low. It has also low creep and shrinkage, meaning to say, you can you can reduce the crack. So this is the advantage why you use, and then they have better corrosion resistance, and you can improve much the strength of this, and. Uh, you can also uh, uh, explore 
different uh, precursors of geopolymer. A uh, calcium clay, okay, you can also use calcium clay. And uh, I think uh, the previous uh, uh, speakers also mentioned about mine tailings. We can also explore this one. No? I mean to say, this is free for all, no? all ideas. What we what we need to do is simply to expound them and then put some put your beautiful ideas into reality, and then make a proposal, and then make it funded, and then do the project. Oh, that one. And yesterday, with this is this is related to this is related to uh, this is related to uh, projects on sustainable materials, no? Which is our topic: sustainable infrastructures. And yesterday we are pleased uh, that uh, Dr. Karin Scribner no, inv uh, accepted our invitation to be part of the Association of ASEP International Convention. And uh, you know, Dr. Karin is uh, one of the pioneering researchers and also a prominent researcher in the field of cementitious materials. No? So she is a professor and also the head of the Materials Lab in Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne in Switzerland. And yesterday, <clears throat> she expressed her, uh, her intention to, to collaborate with us. I also am interested in collaborating with us. And hopefully, uh, we, can, we can form a, a research team. No? I, am, I am happy to be included. No? Of course, I cannot be a project leader because if we're going to submit this to DOST, our project leader should be working in the Philippines, and uh, I cannot, I cannot, uh, I cannot, I cannot qualify for this now. So we have to form a team. No, we have collaboration with several universities, and even industries. Then we can make a proposal, and then we have we can connect Dr. Karen, and then submit the proposal to DOST, or even uh, other external funding agencies. <clears throat> Now I was really surprised when I read this article. No, I don't know this one. I only I only found find this one yesterday, upon reading. And then now they are uh, using geopolymer concrete in building, in building uh, its structure in the moon. You know this one. It's, it's right, quite quite interesting. No, they would like because you know <clears throat> you cannot you cannot bring you cannot bring uh, raw materials from the earth into the moon. It will be impractical and it will be very expensive. So that's why they would like to utilize the, the raw material which is actually in the moon, no? <laughs> that is actually in the moon. And so when I read this one, I was surprised because there are already several studies on this. No? What, what is the concept is that they would like to use uh, regulate, no? I don't know about regulate, maybe chemical engineers knows this one, but I don't know regulate. But they said that the regulate is uh, uh, they, they, they mimic, they don't mean to say the properties of regulate, chemical composition, resembles to that of a fly ash or a G polymer. I see here. Because <clears throat> uh, fly ash or calcium clay, no, I, I've showed you the, the, uh, the compositions, fly ash and calcium clay are rich in silicon and aluminum. Okay. Now, lunar regulate also, regulate also is is a rich no? major composition is silic silicate and aluminate. <laughs> you see here, <clears throat> that means to say they can they can they can make uh, a geopolymer in moon without bringing without bringing fly ash or coal in there. And so what they did, what they did is they now started the the research, they characterize they characterize the properties, but they did not bring any regulate from the moon into the earth. They did not bring that one. So what they did is simply because these properties are the same, instead of bringing a regulate in the, in, in the earth, they just studied fly ash and calcium clay because it resembles the properties. And now there are, there are a series of, of, of tests, there are a series of experiments in, even uh, you can find it in the, in the literatures, you can also find it. And one of the challenges now of, <clears throat> of a building, no, a building habitat walls in the moon is is about uh, if you are going to use regulate plus alkaline activator, no. So they also studied that instead of alkaline activator, they use urine. Is it urine? Yeah, they use urine. Okay, still urine, and also they want to use uh, uh, basalt fiber, no, 
because those can, according to them, basalt fibers can be sourced out in the moon also. So that's what they said. And if you're interested, you can read this one. Now, the only challenge there now is what will be the performance, the curing performance when you are going to erect this in the, in the moon, which is under vacuum conditions. So studies are going on and hopefully, I don't know, hopefully this will be, uh, this will be sorted out uh, in the coming days, in the coming, no, not coming days, but coming years. And then uh, we will be surprised that uh, geopolymer will be already available in moon no? because of these researches. So by that, I would like to end my presentation and uh, uh, thank you for your attention and thank you for inviting me. Hope I provided you some helpful information in which we can work. Thank you.